Uh, okay, so we start now uh, <coughs> the third edition of uh, European Lab Brussels. So we are online, uh, streaming on Facebook and YouTube. So welcome everyone online and here. Thank you for being here. Uh, so this third edition is uh, still uh, in echoes to Nuit Sonore Festival, uh, which is starting tonight as well until uh, Sunday, uh, taking place at Beaux-Arts, but as well in Canal uh, in Brussels. Uh, European Lab will uh, be on uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday uh, tackling different issues. So we'll start with Joachim de Klerk to deal with uh, a topic around architecture uh, that Joachim will present. And we will uh, then continue with some new MEP representing a new generation of politicians. And we will welcome after that uh, French philosopher Bernard Stiegler. And we will finish with a climate activist uh, from different collectives in Europe and in especially more in Belgium and tomorrow we, we will address other issues with um, clubbing resistance uh, with Bogomir de Ringer and as well a panel curated by Africa Desk uh, called um, African Art as Philosophy and we will finish on Saturday uh, dealing with topics such as uh, temporary use spaces in Brussels um, and as well uh, the presence of forensic architecture and Sea Watch. So I let Joachim uh, start this uh, third edition of European Lab um, and I hope you will enjoy the three days of conferences as well workshops and screenings. Thank you. Thank you Laurent. Good. Funny to talk to cameras and three people. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, curious to know if you're from an architecture background or from another background? Architecture? Geography. Okay, spatial backgrounds. Um, as an architect, uh, educated as an architect, um, uh, together with uh, my partners, we immediately launched ourselves not in building uh, the things for which questions are clear, so houses, uh, opera buildings, or other things, but we tried to use the force of imagination and of architecture to envision or to tackle the most complex, wicked problems uh, that we face. Um, the organization I lead together with uh, my colleagues is called Architecture Workroom Brussels. Uh, Brussels has many meanings in that name, but the central word is workroom, and the idea is in fact that that design can be used not only to answer to given questions that others are formulating, but design can also be used to uh, add, add, put things on the agenda, um, launch new trajectories, but also establish a workspace where, in fact, we can uh, combine all the demands, ambitions, requirements from very different actors in one process of uh, developing new uh, visions. Um, I'm going to talk about that, especially uh, through the trajectory we um, set up in um, a temporary uh, building or occupied building, which is the World, Transformation, uh, World Trade Center sorry, in, in Brussels, which is a, the WTC is an emblematic building in uh, Brussels. It's an emblematic name worldwide, the World Trade Center. Um, but it's also an emblematic place in Brussels because it was built uh, in, the, in place, let's say, by demolishing an entire neighborhood as an, let's say, a vision of what the future would be in the 1970s. Uh, world trade would really uh, bring Belgium, Brussels, uh, and even this central part of Europe to another level economically in terms of progress. Um, and it's, of course, interesting that exactly that type of iconic, symbolic uh, building uh, gets empty and is also the location where many different challenges in terms of urban uh, development coincide. Uh, it's a neighborhood um, which is linked to car mobility and especially traffic jams uh, rather than mobility. It's a neighborhood that is also the place where many migration, uh, where a lot of the migration coming to this part of Europe lands. So it's a place of m many contradictions, so very emblematic to address all of these uh, uh, contradictions. We transformed or we occupied this building uh, and transformed it into um, uh, an exhibition, but also much more, and that's actually what I'm going to try to talk to you about. And in that sense, I'm not talking about architecture in the strict sense, but about the role of the designer, the architect, as um, something that goes beyond responding with design work on given questions, but actually launching and initiating uh, new transformations in uh, cities throughout um, 
uh, this part of Europe. We were situated with this building in the northern district of Brussels, that's a kind of central business district uh, in international terms in the city. We were working not only on this uh, uh, city or neighborhood, but on the neighborhood, on the metropolitan area around Brussels, on pieces of Flanders, and also on the delta of the Rhine, the Meuse, and the Skeld, the delta which is in fact um, the, part of, um, yeah, the part of northwest Europe where um, uh, actually the economic entity is a river delta. We have countries, but in fact if you look at the economy and also if you look at the hydrology of this region, these, these country borders have no importance whatsoever. It's actually one physical urban system uh, with very little rivers, little cities, not one big London city or one big Madrid city, little cities that together form one uh, whole. In that uh, space of that city, uh, city, neighborhood, uh, metropolitan area, and that delta, we actually uh, thought it would be crucial to address um, through the lens of architecture and design and by deploying the capacity of imagination and of binding people around one imaginary uh, of architecture of design work to bind people and to address um, the missing link. And that's actually a very important scheme uh, for us. Um, what we see, that's an attempt to draw a portrait of our times. Um, we have a lot of very ambitious goals. If you look to the top right, the sustainable development goals are the, let's say, the highest end and the broadest type of goals we have set. But we have uh, climate agreements that have a deadline, a point on the horizon in 2030. Um, also global, but Europe sets a lot of goals on water quality and so on. Um, but also until very little municipalities everywhere sign an gov a, a, a covenant of mayors, for example, or formulate a goal in terms of sustainability. Um, and that's actually something, the top right of this diagram, where we have to go to, that's actually the points on the horizon, is a very crucial um, type of action. A lot of negotiation is happening in many fields to draw these points, to agree on these points. That's one. Second, left bottom, we have an incredible multiplication of initiatives and of experiments, of living labs, uh, and even the words to describe what this all is are multiplying. Um, and so we see a lot of initiatives, the, the between, that's the second element, we see a lot of investment, a lot of government action to launch new experimental uh, projects to, to make the transition happen. But if we then try to be a little bit critical, we see that the many initiatives do not add up, literally, to bring us to the ambitious goals top right. We are in a way stuck. There's a glass ceiling um, which uh, makes that the little initiatives, the many local initiatives do not add up to the bigger change. But also for people that are in government responsible for realizing the ambitious goals at the top right, they have a glass ceiling. They literally do not know how to land uh, in specific places, communities, and so on. We describe that as the missing link, uh, as something that is really describing this, uh, the, a very crucial description of our times. And with this missing link, we actually try to say the most important thing we need to address is how we actually can accelerate or multiply the changes in our society so that we could eventually maybe not formulate goals, but also design pathways to, to reach those goals. And then comes back the question of space, because the moment you talk about these many goals to the top right, not everything, but a large part of all of these goals, transitions, energy, food, water, um, solidarity, are always things that you can describe in abstract uh, numbers, mathematics, texts and goals. But finally, they have to land in one space. And you could even say that there's a battle for space. There's an ongoing battle for space. And this battle for space is, for example, in every street of any city in Europe, you have the roads, the current mobility system that requires a lot of space to pass by with cars, to stock cars, so the kind of uh, cemetery for cars which cities have become. But at the same time, in cities, we need much more water infiltration. It's the same space. We, will, we cannot make cities resilient in terms of uh, peak rain and drought periods if we cannot change our mobility system. So the moment you make, you look at all of of these ambitious goals that are far uh, uh, away from us in time, 
and you bring them to concrete spaces, you can actually start to see the connections, the interdependencies between those uh, problems, and you can actually start designing on these questions. And that's actually for which we set up um, a, an environment. What you see is that um, design can bring in several things. One is to change the rhetoric. The, the future is described as something that engenders a lot of loss, eh? less flying, less meat and continue, less income, less wealth. But in fact, the future, if we can start imagining the future, it has always worked like that in the past. We can also try to describe and talk about the future as something that also is about a lot of wins, a lot of qualities we could win. That's one side of the imagination. A lot of exercises are already ongoing at neighborhood levels, at regional levels at this scale, but still the, the major narrative uh, in cities uh, throughout um, Europe, but actually throughout the world, is a, is a narrative of loss. The future will be less, hence we actually stay where we are. We do not change. It's better not to change because we will lose. Imagination can actually help clarify what we could win, which kind of environment we could wish for and decide to move towards. The second thing is we need to bring all these major questions to the here and the now. They are not far away from us. 2030 is actually now, um, but they're also here. They are not very abstract. They are not uh, paragraphs in policy documents. They are changes in your street. And to make it here and now is very easy if you make a historical description. These are a fantastic uh, exercise that has been done by the Flemish Architecture Institute with uh, universities and photographers, which is to uh, build on the historical photography the two, top, the two top photographs, same location photographed in two instances in history, in 2004 and 2014, if I'm not mistaken, the same location was photographed again. And then you see that you can describe how uh, a water system top left, which had the capacity to store a lot of water and to deal with uh, the, the variations in our climate, has become one of the most hardened, let's say, sealed, capped uh, surfaces um, in, of Europe. So this part of the delta has a, as much hard surface as Malta, which is built, which is a rock. So it means that, uh, and we are the top of Europe, no, no other place in Europe has so much of its total surface that is hard, uh, hardened, concrete, so impermeable for water. And you can actually see that. The question is now, how can we, in a way, go back in time, not in time, but go back in that logic and make space, make space again for this infiltration. And we can only do that when we do that here and now. And that's also something that people are interested in. If we use an example of something we collaborated uh, uh, on in Kortrijk, a little city in the west of Belgium. The moment you start to say to citizens, you have to choose, are you in favor of cycling? Everybody will say yes. Are you in favor of green? Yes. Are you in favor of double parking, two sides uh, parking? Yes, preferably. Are you instead in favor of one direction or two directions in your street? Preferably two. The moment you say, sorry, the planet is end, has an end uh, has a space that is limited, but also your street has a space that is limited, so you will, help, you will have to help us choose. That's the moment when citizens become much more sm smart, intelligent, try to understand why what would be important, and help, bottom right, to decide for what they would like to make space. And it's not something that people withdraw from, it's something they engage with, because it's the moment they can actually make it very concrete. If we have less cars, space for cars, we have more space for infiltration, green, for uh, safe, uh, slow mobility. And it's actually a cycle. Everything depends on each other in the limited space we have. And it's something people can really engage with. So the big question is, how can we break down these enormous challenges that are ahead of us, that we talk about on a daily uh, rhythm in the newspapers, to concrete transformations, feasible, something we can see, touch, talk about in the concrete spaces of our environment. But then if we, we do that, there are many examples of this, but then the question is how can we accelerate or multiply? The question is not to do that once, because then we're in the left bottom again. One good initiative does not change the world. It's an enormous effort to realize it, but still the hope is that we can find moments of acceleration. And that's something that is also interesting, because there you see new networks establishing, governmental networks, but also sometimes citizens' initiatives. The protests around schools in Belgium, which were uh, provoked 
by a documentary on television showing that in the uh, uh, blood and urine of kids, the, the amount of uh, damaging uh, particles produced by traffic or is, is so high, led to protests at every school gate, 130 schools every Friday morning, and that actually leads to a network. If we could actually try to work with this network and make sure that around these 130 places we can change the streetscape, we will change also the behavior of those parents bringing their kids to school, and we will actually have maybe much more impact than making top uh, right, making mobility plans for a distant future. So the goal is, can we accelerate? And the same goes for the drought problem. We are working with farmers and all the policy makers uh, in terms of farming to deal with the drought problem, not by making a drought plan or a strategy that is uh, maps and um, uh, very ambitious goals, but that is about facilitating changes by these farmers making space for water management on their plots something that they are very much against. So we need to find ways to break it up and to multiply uh, this entire change. And that's also what we try to do to make a place for, um, which is not this institutional space of Bozar or of other cultural institutions, but which is, which is an in-between space, a cultural in-between space, um, where it's not belonging to either the cultural sector, either the governmental sector, either the profit-driven uh, sector or the non-profit-driven sector. It's an in-between space. Um, a free space to share and couple the capacities of citizens' initiatives with governmental capacities, sometimes finances, but also knowledge, academic institutions, uh, cultural capacities, and so on. The occupation of this uh, World Trade Center, of which you see a photograph here, um, into a, uh, an, uh, a, a manifestation, you could say, with the title, You Are Here. You are here meaning uh, to, in to invite you um, to the place where this was happening, but to also confront you with the fact that we are completely stuck here. We need to move to another place if you look at this missing link diagram, but we're completely stuck where we are. That's where we started to occupy the building, to see the building as a stage, to see the building as a test site, and to see the building as an exhibition, and a stage for working sessions, an occupation, a walk, a promenade architecturale for the architects, um, a very famous term launched, uh, coined by Le Corbusier, for his villa projects became a kind of walk through a building, through exhibitions, to end up with a working space. A building that has actually an enormous quality, uh, you could say, which is no longer visible because no longer there, will be renovated and become another uh, type of building. Um, and a building where we actually try to say we can hack that missing link, if we can make an in-between space between all these very different actors, which will be necessary to implement change. It, we're talking about farmers, developers, designers, the building practice, even the material providers. If we want to go to a circular economy, we can talk about policy making for that. But actually, it's more in the pragmatics of doing that we have to invent. The cultural innovation is really the change of culture for which you need cultural innovation is much more in the doing than in the talking about what we should do. We've, done, we've talked for a long time about what we should do. So what uh, was set up is actually a threefold uh, structure. Um, it was an exhibition. An exhibition, you could describe it best as a library of good practices. Not the ones that we did, but the ones that others are doing in many different places. We tried to structure that so that we could actually build a narrative. The second thing is an urban debate program. And the third thing is a shared societal workspace. A workspace where we offered coffee, apples, water, support by designers for trajectories that were, could be set up by governments or by local initiatives, gov uh, citizens' initiatives. We assisted them to connect to each other, to bridge actually from a local initiative that is sometimes mostly actually starting from protest, to go from protest to proposition and from, from proposition to see who could actually be the governmental institution or the financing private party to go with this uh, project. Um, so if you make it more simple, it's a podium, an exhibition, it's a forum, a debate place, and it's a learning by doing or an incubator for new strategies on the other hand. Um, the forum was actually bringing together very different initiatives. Um, in this one place from different scales, so from this same delta, but also from very different 
um, uh, horizons. The forum was composed of a series of public uh, debates where we immediately combined governmental responsibles, not with their peers, because they, that's the ones they meet on a daily basis, but with others. So with people from, uh, with people from the design world that actually produce ideas that can only be valued, truly valued, if they are not remaining in the field of architecture and architecture publications, but move into the field of conversation with these other uh, uh, policy makers or economic uh, actors. So a, a mixing uh, space. That became around 10 societal uh, challenges for which we had as criterion. They have to be and structurally important, but also be part of the daily debate in newspapers. We said we organize uh, part of the exhibition, but also part of uh, the debate uh, sessions. And for example, food growers make city, mobility as an urban uh, project. Um, uh, urban by nature, circular city harbors, they're all touching on transitions, but also on types of places where we can make that uh, happen. Um, the same goes for uh, working sessions, where we try to actually think of how we can actually organize this, not in this place only, but how we can actually learn from many different places where these in-between uh, societal incubators, uh, there are different words, uh, impact hubs, you have all kinds of words of new types of places. You could say it's the infrastructure of our cities of the future, for the future and of the future. It's not only the standard, standard known cultural buildings we have. It's not the theaters only. It's not the schools. It's also these workspaces which are not defined in terms of producing or offering something that you can consume as culture. It's a space where you can actually produce something new, co-produce something new. It requires a specific societal workspace, learning network, also financial models are being discussed, co-financing, cooperative models, alternative democratic uh, systems are used there because it's no longer about the one that is in governmental level decides. It's actually the real decision is a coalition of people from government with people on the ground and others. That's what can make change happen. That's what we uh, organized. And a third level we organized is also an exchange between the practice. We called it the practice of practices, different design disciplines doing very different types of work, the ones being busy with public buildings up till the others exploring what the circular economy would mean for urban development, up till others being busy to develop their own new circular building materials, very different types of things, each of those very fragile, like very little, uh, extremely in ambitious, but very fragile operation, economically, economically fragile, but also content-wise fragile. But then if you see what the design capacity is, if you add it up and you make a chain effect, the one mapping how circular metabolic flows in cities could actually be crucial for the further urban development with the ones producing new types of material, with the ones like rotor deconstruction, harvesting materials in our city, that actually can become a chain effect, which is of structural importance. So a practice of practices is a crucial approach to say individually each practice can be genius. That's what architects also mostly love, to be the individual genius. But actually it's in the shared capacity we can identify and in the chain effects of those capacities that real change can start to uh, happen. You see how this also became a space where very different types of publics, uh, the tours uh, we did, the material that is around the table always changed and evolved because we, we made a, a library of good examples to address different subjects. It also became a space where the youngest uh, in our society were having classes in their classrooms at school, but then came with their visions for the future to this place to discuss around a, 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 a pilot city's side what the future could be. So it's something that is very difficult to imagine, but the moment I would say that it's much more simple for kids than for people that are professionally educated, that's actually rather the truth. People, kids understand that if it rains, that the rain has to go in the soil, while we who know that the city is hardened for cars have immediately a, refl a reaction that says, ah, but then we have to change the mobility system and we see complexity, so we say stop reduce the solution to the things we can handle. Don't touch the complexity. Kids go through complexities. And that's actually an interesting side of doing. But of course, all of this is an environment in which the crucial aspect is the learning by doing. So the learning by doing requires an infrastructure. It's an infrastructure of tables, of people meeting, 
it's an, infrastru it's an infrastructure in the sense that a, a methodology was offered, uh, bring in a tangible urgency around the table. Um, we will connect, help you connect with others which have the same type of question. Uh, we, together, we will try to envision what a, a strategic approach is for these different locations, school environments, for example, or farmers with drought problems. We will help you identify a common strategy. And if we can identify this common strategy, we can actually also uh, connect to the policymakers, uh, financing parties that are ready for that. And we can, point five, trigger that was the word we invented, viral transformation. A virus is mostly something quite, quite negative, but the, the, the logic of a virus, which is that it invades many places at the same time, it, has an, it goes into the veins of a system, that's actually the change we need, and that's the way to hack the missing link. Some images. It functioned as an incubator, um, where different, here we see, for example, the designers, air quality experts, urbanists, mobility experts, with parents from schools, uh, from 15 schools we selected to work on a Saturday morning on the changes of their direct school environment, working around the table with the plans on the, ta on the table we prepared so that they could not talk about something but prospect what would be the changes in their direct environment. Um, same uh, session. But it also goes for here the farmers, showing how their concrete problems on the ground are actually the same as the ones that are described in ambitious visionary uh, strategy documents at governmental levels or academic studies on the same questions. We need to bind this knowledge together in certain uh, places and that's actually for which this space provided an infrastructure and the uh, support. The effect of this is, and that's where it became uh, surprising for the ones organizing amongst others uh, and in the... Uh, we No. Is it okay if I take this microphone, the other one? Yes? Online has sound. Thanks. The, um, the, to our surprise, this became an incubator where governments threw in trajectories, questions, where local citizens, local citizen groups threw in questions into the space, met each other, and out of this, we, with a lot of hard work, of course, not as a lottery system, it became something in which new trajectories were incubated. It took three, four months to start from something. We're still busy with working on things that started in September 2018 and that we're accompanying to become uh, something else. But the fact that, for example, these people were working together led to different tra trajectories, but that's also investment trajectories, where suddenly um, as a trajectory was being prepared by a department of planning, the space was hosting a forum on de-concreting, de-capping, so taking away the hard surface in our urban environments. 60 to 70 people said, we are ready to come, which suddenly means, oh, we're not talking about a policy idea, we're talking about concrete questions in diff different places and cities. Suddenly you have a constituency, you have a mini-democracy around, uh, around the vague ambition, and that mini-democracy is crucial because the moment you can share questions and share beliefs that you need to change, you can also go to politicians, not as experts, saying, if we analyze the climate change, we can advise you that you should actually take away the hard surface in your cities. That's an interesting advice from experts to policymakers. But the moment you can build a constituency for that change, a demand-driven change, you have a constituency that has another voice and another effect on political and policy-making systems. And that means that you build up an environment in which suddenly a minister understands that the advice she already got from her policy-making uh, uh, administrations is more than an advice. It reflects the concrete questions on the ground for support from supra-local governments. Le leads to, we will make free 10 million euros for 50 pilot projects in de-hardening, supporting local actors to make it happen on the ground. So it's the reversal of the logic. The supra-local authority does not do it on the ground, but says, I will support many different actions in different fields on the ground. The same goes for um, the drought uh, or water uh, approach, the uh, de-hardening, the, de the drought uh, uh, problems, the development of agricultural parks or agricultural landscapes around cities is now being uh, developed because 
the, from the strong unions busy with agriculture and from the cities, there are different demands, but the same, they come together in demanding that the fringes of our cities would not be occupied with housing so that we generate even more mobility, but that there the open space would be protected also for food production for the city, because many cities are developing food strategies for which you need space. So the battle for space I started with becomes very, cl very clear, and here uh, uh, agricultural parks are being developed. Uh, slow mobility neighborhoods was a trajectory that was uh, developed. In Brussels, you have the good food, uh, the good move. You also have the good food strategy, but also the good move uh, strategy, which is a strategic plan to actually make sure that neighborhoods are low intensive in terms of uh, going through, uh, drive through uh, better traffic. But that also requires a strategy to implement that as a policy idea. That's one. But to implement it, the operational, the implementation requires really another process and another uh, invention. I will skip some of those. The podium uh, allowed us to actually bring people to these ideas and also to this place, which is not about, uh, and other people brought other people, so it was a kind of a cascading uh, effect, where it's not about the ones you know that you bring around the table. It's the ones you do not know yet it's people that are busy with something of which you have no knowledge whatsoever in your own network that are invited, that get the kind of uh, space, infrastructure, support to come and uh, make the next step. And therefore, the exhibition, the occupation of the World Trade Center and what is at the heart of a World Trade Center is clearly a bank, uh, of course. The old bank lobby became a place where we exhibited very different voices on climate change, where we actually, the statement was, we have to go beyond words. Um, and with the words of many interesting people, we tried to highlight that. Another a second exhibition, The Practice of Practices, which was, or The Future is a Practice, an exhibition where we exhibited 24 very, very different types of practices, which add up to a, which together actually enable us to think that we could make really drastic change. And the top, let's say the 23rd floor, which is not the top, but the higher floor uh, of the building, became the kind of library of strategies around very different uh, strategies. This is the strategy city as sponge, where in fact we need to make water infiltration in our cities feasible. That water infiltration is something for which you need strategies at the global scale. The World Bank has policies on that. There's a lots of money for that, but they don't find projects on the ground. And we're working on the water as leverage project as one of those. You have urban uh, projects you need, you have the, the vertical element is a creek in Genk, a city in uh, Flanders, where in fact w uh, through one valley system the attempt is to really reform the entire city through the lens of water, of making sponge capacity in a city. But also in Brussels, the, the, bot the right, you see the typical Brussels houses, where in fact one of the crucial questions is how will we deal in Brussels with all the water that falls on this very hard uh, concrete uh, city which flows into the, the gutter, the sewage system, and then into the canal and the Seine River. But if we have that, it means that it goes into the sewage system and all the dirt goes also in our river systems, the, the canal and the Seine River, once a week on average. So it means we need completely different system to stock and let the water that falls on our city infiltrate. And it means that you can actually start with your garden the way you deal with water on your roof going to your garden is a crucial element to deal with this global challenge of dealing with the water problem. And that's the interesting thing we always try to highlight, that uh, you all know the Matrushka dolls, the Russian dolls, if you take one off the other, you always end up with a smaller one. That's how we have to think of change. That's also how we have to design change. We need to work, and that's what architects, urbanists were specialists, big problems, and politicians also, Big problems need big decisions. Big problems need big visionary moments at regional scales or national scales. But in fact, if we can't break it up to small interventions from our house, our building block, our street, our neighborhood, to the city, if we can't build it up from there, it is intangible first, and second, it also it can never happen. It's in our neighborhoods that we need to uh, realize it. 
Also in the neighborhood, here Pool is Cool, uh, as a fantastic uh, organization uh, with a strong plea for uh, open air swimming pools in Brussels um, with uh, lots of success, uh, given that the new regional uh, uh, politi political agreement includes uh, going for uh, implementation of these schools, occupied the fountain in the midst of this uh, car mobility driven uh, uh, central business district of Brussels, the Manhattan district as it's called, uh, which also shows the initial ambition of the 70s for this. Next is that we're trying to build, continue this construction for the next uh, years. And actually this pooling of knowledge, the initiation of trajectories and the realization of these things. So from pooling in an, through an exhibition, everything that is being developed, bringing, organizing a platform where different actors can come together to make the next steps, to formulate what the next steps could be and to incubate next steps towards realization. That's actually how we are building our future steps. We are already, that's a, a, a drawing um, of where we are moving to. We are uh, trying to, we are now occupy another temporary occupation, the Actiris building at the Burs, uh, Buchs in Brussels, which is an, a former government building which will become a private development, but in the meantime, it's empty. There was, just like in the World Trade Center, there was occupation by artists, which are always the first to find the, and occupy these places. And like in the way they say, we uh, in a way followed them. Many of the same people, people work, which were in the WTC World Trade Center are now in the Actiris building. And we occupied the first floor of that building where we will again try to host um, a workspace. We launched it today. There were all the dehardening, the, the 25 of the dehardening projects work together in this place, exchanging their ideas, their capacities, their insights, so that we can actually pool and add up the knowledge we have instead of work plick plock in different locations without concertation, without adding up and building the next step. One of our uh, structural ambitions, and it stays at the level of ambition because of financial capacities, is the, the exhibition is a very heavy uh, format to, to group knowledge. Our hope is, but it's also a very heavy format, that we can actually build an, a growing online library of strategies to make that happen, so that it becomes much more of a peer-to-peer -peer environment, an environment in which the, the peers, there's many municipalities that are now working on the energy transition in neighborhoods, they're all having the same problem. What happens now is that each of those commissions to the same type of uh, consultancy offices and designers cons 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 let's say, commissions the same type of question. It's a ridiculous system. If we can't pool the questions we have, we can never have a structural impact with the answers we develop. So we need a, a more online, networked, peer-to-peer uh, -peer platform and environment to facilitate structural change and to actually have a critical mass uh, of uh, change. That knowledge is in development. I could stop here. One thing I would like to, I have three, four, five more minutes. Um, which is something we, that came out of this, is the development of, a, of an atelier, a platform. The first attempt of this peer-to-peer -peer environment started, uh, or we initiated it together with Dutch and Belgian parties on the Delta. We are broadening it now to Germany and parts of France, um, which is the Delta Atelier. The Delta Atelier is, of course, focusing on this physical system uh, which we started to inhabit ages ago, centuries ago, but in the 12th century, we talk now about the urban age, but this was the first place in the world to, and it's, uh, that urbanized very quickly, where we had suddenly an economic upward cycle, but also an urbanization. That's the moment when many of the cities we now know uh, knew a first um, uh, important growth. That's uh, a sit also an environment where you can clearly see in the historical maps that the importance of the water system, of the soil quality, uh, was linked to where cities were located because that was our first transport, uh, it was the first metro network, but then water uh, driven. And so you see that the, the link between us having built an enormous urban system on top of this very, let's say, fertile soil, water intensive and water rich uh, uh, environment was crucial. Um, the missing link I already explained. Um, the agreement on this uh, cooperation is strong, so between different parties at the Benelux level, Flemish, Dutch, Dutch, North Rhine-Westfalen, Flanders, North Rhine-Westfalen, everybody with each other has agreements that it's very important. 
but there's actually no shared development of questions of strategies. Actually, everybody's negotiating with one another. If the Netherlands wants to build something through Flanders, they are negotiating. We want to do this and we want you to allow us to do this. If Belgium wants that uh, the port of Antwerp can actually reach the, the, the North Sea and hence the, the oceans and other ports, they're negotiating. But they're not, there's no shared narrative. And so one of the things we were involved in uh, between 2015 and 18 was the first exploration of a lowland or a delta strategy, a shared strategy for this environment. Um, where, in fact, uh, I will go through ser several strategies for how can we change our spatial layout or organization of our cities and our landscapes in function of a shared ambition in terms of renewable energy. The Netherlands were then still very gas addicted, with Shell as the global corporation uh, coming from the Netherlands um, uh, were still gas addicted. They had three to four percent of renewable energy uh, sources, which was one of the lowest uh, in Europe. Now, as a uh, uh, Groningen is trembling uh, through, as, an, as a consequence of fracking. They are accelerating in incredible speeds as the Dutch are able to do uh, their transition towards renewable energy and going off the gas uh, system. But that, also, that is a real challenge of how you do that together. We, have, uh, we can't do it alone. You cannot think of it alone. The same goes for mobility and for agriculture. Together, the Netherlands and Belgium are the largest exporter in terms of uh, food products, agro-industry of the world before the United States. So if you look at the Delta as a unit, it's the largest port of the world, it's the largest exporter of agro-industrial products. So if you want to change, if you want to move towards a carbon neutral environment, you can imagine that the ports will not, one of the ports will not say, imagine Antwerp, I will go f fast, I will go towards a circular economy. Rotterdam would actually be much more popular because they continue with the fossil fuel driven economy. So you need an agreement on how you move towards the future, otherwise you comp compete each other downward instead of forward or backward instead of forward. So what we did is also trying to bridge uh, knowledge and in 2018 we actually launched um, a call for um, initiatives in this delta that want to form a peer-to-peer -peer environment, a delta atelier, to say we have knowledge at the national level, we have knowledge in little cities on the transitions, energy, food, and so on. And we brought together more than 50 uh, people. We exhibited, we made narratives of what they are able to do together. Somebody's in a small location intervening in energy renovation with somebody else intervening in energy landscapes and an ener a national energy policy the Russian doll, that's actually how you can actually build a narrative of how change could really happen. And it's always change that is spatialized. It's not intangible changes of behavior. It's really changing or adapting our environment so that we can live a different life. We built an exhibition around that in Rotterdam with all these examples from small uh, to bigger. And in this exhibition, we actually started to uh, collect all the insights make a workbook, a strategy book, you could say, connect experts to that and hold sessions. Add up the knowledge and formulate together what the next steps would be. And because these next steps were not formulated by experts only, but were collectively formulated, the effect of that is, and then I will stop uh, more or less, the effect of this was that a governmental party that was around the table said, this is interesting. Designers are not formulating which commission they would like to compete for tomorrow, but they are formulating ideas that I could pick up as policymaker. And we are no longer in a commissioner-client relationship. We are actually co-constructing what the next step is. And then if I, as a governmental agency, would make available some amount of money to this table, we could set up the next step. And that's actually what is happening around these tables. The next steps were constructed were for really formulated on sheets of paper. This is what we should do. Who should do this? Who should enable this? And now, and then I will go a little bit quick, the, what is happening is through the exhibitions and the debates is that these projects are actually uh, happening. Many participants, very different types of participants, very different work formats, uh, plenary sessions, working sessions, and now I have no image anymore, so that makes it easier to conclude. I will then conclude here. Um, the many different sessions, but out of this came 
new explorations defined not by governments, by people around one table. For example, an exploration into circular harbors, the harbors of Rotterdam, uh, of uh, Ghent, of Antwerp, sat together around one of these debate tables with designers working for the port of Rotterdam and policy makers of the Netherlands and Flanders said, we need to explore how with new types of projects, circular city ports, like the Rotterdam Makers District in Rotterdam, which is a part of the, er the harbor, which becomes uh, the incubator for making industries, but it also requires a completely different design strategy. Uh, it, it requires, it's another type of urban port project. And it means that all the ports said, we actually know we need this, but we don't have the capacity to develop that alone. So it would be great if it would be developed in this peer-to-peer -peer platform as an incubator of new strategies. And that's actually what happened with the support of governmental institutions, a cooperation with designers and ports has been set up to explore what the next step would be. Now, after an uh, indexing of what 11 ports in this delta from Germany to France, uh, to uh, Wallonia, Brussels, Flanders, the Netherlands would want and need, it's clear that we could actually say we need a next step. We know that we, we need, we have seven types of strategies, spatial strategies which we could develop and we need to make the next uh, step. And so this is the idea of this peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, environment. I will go back. Uh, this peer-to-peer -peer environment and also the idea of, I started with the transformation workspace was the title or the World Transformation Center. We need new types of infrastructure where we, do, we are not, as architects, urbanists, the genius designers that have the best answer to any given problem, but where we actually accommodate processes of cooperation between very different stakeholders, if they together could formulate and if we could visualize where that question is landing and what potential solutions are, we can actually multiply the changes in many locations. We have the feeling and a hunch, and that's also what many people tell us, that these types of third spaces, social, uh, social spatial incubate, incubators, impact hubs, all the words you could use for it, are an infrastructure that we now see as incidental and nice in our cities, but will become a structural element, a crucial uh, infrastructure if we really want to make to not talk about the changes and the future we would need to want or we would want but if we would like to make the changes happen on the ground we need these these translation incubators which go from very ambitious goals to concrete changes in our streets our neighborhoods and our cities thank you <laughs>